Hello and welcome to Blockchain Gaming World with me, John Jordan, episode 95. We're almost there, almost there. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased uh, that today I'm talking to Michael Saunders, who is the co-founder and the chief storyteller at uh, Horizon Blockchain Games. How's it going, Michael? I'm doing wonderfully. How are you, John? Good. Yes, good. We were just discussing uh, how long ago we, we, we last spoke because uh, you're one of these projects who, who've been around for, for a while um, as, as we sort of sort of coming now into into a bit more blockchain games kind of coming into into the mainstream view and uh it's kind of kind of great to see these companies who've been around doing interesting things for a while sort of sort of coming through uh, but before we get into too much detail because you've just done a funding round and you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on with with, with, with sky uh weaver your game um should we find a little bit about how you got into into blockchain because i think there are some some interesting sort of parallels i guess we all have but we all find our own sort of have our own sort of interesting kind of story and, it, and i think it, it always interests me at least so Cool, yeah, so um, I first heard of Bitcoin in late 2009, and um, it really sparked my interest, this decentralized currency. In that moment, I actually thought this is the future, but uh, it took me a couple years to figure out how to actually acquire Bitcoin. I couldn't really wrap my head around the notion of exchanging cash for like a 56 digit alphanumeric sequence. It's just like, this doesn't make sense. So it took me a few years, um, and then I, you know, then I became more uh, officially um, participating in the space. I invested in um, a mining company. And then I actually met Vitalik Buterin in January 2014, wow. about a year and a half prior to Ethereum's launch. And he was talking about smart contracts and decentralized governance. And while admittedly like 95% of what he was saying went over my head, I was covered in goosebumps. And I said to my friend that I think Vitalik is an alien from the future that's here to teach us about economics and love. So I actually kind of fell in love with it despite not really understanding it. And then, you know, 18 months later it launched and I still didn't really understand it that well. But I, you know, I kept learning and learning, immersing myself in the space and really seeing this potential for blockchain and Ethereum to be an incredibly powerful and meaning technology from a humanitarian perspective, an economic perspective, and a socio-cultural perspective. And then at the end of 2017, I had the fortune of meeting one of my co-founders and our CEO, Peter Pialtika, and he was the first person that I ever heard talk about blockchain gaming. And he had this, he and a few others had this idea for a game called Skyweaver, and I thought, holy shit, this is it. This is how we can help people use this technology and understand it and do it in a fun way. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's, that's, uh, it's kind of interesting with the blockchain. There's only so far you can go back and pretty much, pretty much you, you, you were right there at the, <laughs> kind of at the beginning, much, much, much earlier than me. Although I always remember I, I did, I did open a crack. I don't know what I was doing. I opened a Kraken account and then I had to write down these, <laughs> these crazy sequence of things. I, I can't remember. I, I never bought any, so it was a waste of time. But uh, I think it's, it's interesting how I, I think for those of us who were in the gaming space, you know, it's the kind of Bitcoin itself was, yeah, as you say, sort of conceptually sort of in, what's this interesting sort of thing, but but not very useful mm. in terms of what we were trying to do. And it was really Ethereum that sort of launched that. So um, in terms of kind of, um, as I say, you guys have been around for a while kind of building and, 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 and seeing how you're going to sort of approach this space. But the reason we're doing this podcast now is you just uh, announced a, a funding round. So now I'm very interested in funding rounds. I appreciate most most people aren't as interested in funding rounds as me. Um, but but maybe just sort of explain a little bit about kind of what what that funding round means sort of for you as, for you as a company and why that why people you know should sort of care about it who care about blockchain games or particularly Skyweaver. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So just to give everyone a little bit of context, um, what we're doing at Horizon is we're building a new dimension where economies are fun, accessible, and for the benefit of all participants. And to achieve that vision, we're really we're driving Web3 adoption by making blockchain easy, fun, and powerful for users and developers. Uh, we have our Web3 wallet, uh, friendly Web3 wallet and developer platform sequence, and our trading card game Skyweaver, which I'm sure we'll dive into more details in a bit. And with this uh, funding round, um, it's actually a pre-Series A safe. Um, so we weren't actively raising at the time, but we've you know the crypto space is quite a hot market, games are a hot market. And so we've had a lot of inbound interest and people have noticed what we're building. And we had the opportunity to, you know, receive investment and the help of Bitcraft Ventures, which are, you know, leaders in the gaming space, leaders in synthetic reality, and just have a wonderful uh, group over there with Maritz, Jens, Piers, and, and the whole team at Bitcraft. 
Um, and then we also, uh, one of our existing investors, CMT Digital, decided to contribute even more. And they're leaders in the blockchain space, Colleen, Sam, uh, Charlie, and, and everyone else. They're incredible. And then we brought on a group called The Exchange Company, who uh, Todd has been one of our advisors since day one of the company. And he's been incredible. He's launching this new fund. And then a couple of specialists in blockchain and regulatory, especially in the Canadian landscape, which because we're headquartered in Canada, we have a lot of assistance in the U.S., but it's, of course, good to have it in your native country as well. Mm. And um, and their names are Zishan and Khaled. So this funding round is um, it, it's prior to our Series A. Um, and uh, it just it really allows us to focus on launching both Skyweaver and Sequence. We're making a number of critical hires at the moment. Uh, we're hiring, we're expanding the team, and then it gears us up for launch. And then after launch, um, you know, a few months in, we'll likely do a, a larger financing round to drive the vision forward. I guess until you sort of people get involved, or people who haven't been involved in, in sort of startups, which I guess is sort of sort of most people, it, it, it kind of funding is one of these kind of kind of bizarre things. That it seems like sort of money is sort of magic out of sort of thin air, and uh, but actually, you know, it's it's all it's sort of always this kind of contrary thing. Whenever you need money, it's really hard to find, and you spend all your time looking to find it. And when mm. you don't need it, actually, you, and certainly as you say. Blockchain gaming is super hot at the moment, so there's just lots of money floating around looking looking for it. You sort of sort of get it, but but it can. I think it, I guess from my point of view, it seems interesting that as you say, this is sort of a pre a pre uh, kind of Series A, which would be like the, the first formal big big round. And it's sort of if people are throwing money at you, it's just a, a quick way of doing it. And and because these other big deals can take a long time to kind of work out who's putting in what, and everyone has to sign the contract, and it, you know those things can go on for you know for, for months and, and potentially even years. So it's sort of sensible to sort of get the money now. You know you're kind of got those that, that kind of roadmap to launch. You don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. Um, so so I guess from that point of view, it's for people who are interested in blockchain games, this sort of stuff is useful because it just means we know Skyweaver is cut, nailed down. You know, you know to, to, to to sort of go through its its first phases um so, so that's good you say you're, you're based in canada um yeah you're in montreal is that right or the headquarters in montreal uh actually we're, we're headquartered in toronto we do have uh team members in montreal and then other team mm. members all around the world like croatia spain jamaica mm. brazil uh ireland and probably forgetting a few at the <laughs> yeah. moment as well how do you how do you find the, the canadian scene because i guess you've we've also got sort of flow over in vancouver i guess who are the, probably the best known but um it, is it do you think it's building yeah. up momentum in Canada for, for blockchain? Def case? Definitely. I mean, you know, Ethereum was invented here. Um, Vitalik Buterin was living in Waterloo um, at the time. And, you know, I think back and forth between Toronto. Um, and so, you know, that's that's where I met him the first time was in Toronto. Um, you know, there's an L4 research division part of uh, Ethereum based in Toronto. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think there is, um, you know, just tech in general is quite uh, prominent in Toronto and, and blockchain specifically. Mm. Cool. Good. So let's talk a bit about um, Skyweaver, which I guess is going to be the sort of the main bulk of what, what we do. Can you sort of explain, um, yeah, give, give us the sort of ele elevated pitch for, you know, Skyweaver. Yeah. Yeah. So Skyweaver is a, it's a free to play trading card game where your skill is rewarded. And in fact, all cards are generated by players through gameplay. And I mean, I'm guessing everyone on this podcast listening knows what a trading card game is, but you know, like Pokemon, Hearthstone, Magic. Um, this is an online version where you can actually own the cards, the digital cards that you're playing with. And right now we have 500 unique cards. So each one of them has different mechanics, different artwork, different abilities. And you can unlock the entire base collection of cards for free. And these base cards, they're, they're non-tradable items, but they unlock all the gameplay for you. Mm. And then by ranking highly on a competitive leaderboard, you can win what are called ranked rewards. And these are what are called silver cards. And silver cards are tradable NFTs. So they're cosmetically enhanced versions of base cards. They don't give you a gameplay advantage over the base card equivalent, mm. but they do let you flex your status and you can sell these cards as well on the market, on, on the Skyweaver market, on a, another market, you can gift it to your friend, you can destroy it, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another really awesome uh, game mode called Conquest, which is a player versus player single elimination game mode. So players enter by staking either one silver card or one dollar. Mm. And if you lose your first match, you lose your stake mm. and you just gain experience points. Um, but if you win one match, you win one silver card. 
If you win two matches, you win two silver cards. And if you win all three matches in a conquest, you win one silver card and one rare gold card. And again, the gold card is a cosmetically enhanced version of the silver. Uh, no gameplay advantage, but it's rare. And each week of the 500 unique cards currently available in Skyweaver, each week only eight of those are available to be won by a conquest. Okay. And then in the second week, it's a new eight card. So if you don't win it in that first week, the only way to obtain that card is by buying it from another player. Um, so it's really it's a really special economy design in that like Horizon as a company we don't even we don't sell any cards on a primary market. In fact, they're all created by players through gameplay. So that's quite a interesting approach where we've we've seen you know that there's plenty of trading card games out there. I, clearly, it's a it's a genre that that particularly meshes well with the concept of of blockchain because you have cards and, and and there's kind of you know single items and obviously you know magic gathering back in the day when you played it or even now if you play it physically it is very much sort of like a, a pre-blockchain blockchain game because you physically own the cards and you can trade them with people so it's kind of you can kind of see why there's lots of sort of uh trading trading card games out there but um obviously you know one way for sort of developers to fund their um their, their development is, is to kind of sell cards card packs we've, we've seen plenty of that happening in the past and you've taken a radical decision sort of not to do it that way so was is that because you you think that just sort of causes um sort of uh too much focus on sort of monetary gain as, as, as a kind of as, as a kind of a system or do you think it kind of messes with the in some ways sort of the gameplay why have you taken that that, that move yeah so it's very intentional decision on our part in that when we were first building the game, we did not know the exact mechanics mm -hmm. of the economy and we didn't want to sell an item for a, a game and economy that we didn't fully understand yet because then that's a promise to uh, a purchaser that that card means something, right? And then let's say the game gets out of balance and you need to totally ban those cards and then these early investors just get kind of screwed over, you know, and, and not saying that there's not a way to make it work. I'm not commenting on that, but this is just, um, we were very intentional about that. We wanted to deeply think about an economy and game design that would be, that could be sustainable and that players would benefit from and that they would truly adore. Presumably, would you still, I mean, I guess I, I, I totally, totally appreciate kind of what the decision there, because obviously when you're building a game, particularly uh, trading card games are sort of notorious to sort of balance and, and obviously the <laughs> famous stories have not been balanced mm -hmm. and we've seen some blockchain ones that have sort of come ad adrift in that way but but there's still a case that at some point you have to sort of nail down what your what your those first 500 are um so 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 you, you're i can see you're yeah, eliminating yeah. sort of a lot of the risk but there still could be a case where cards have to be nerfed or or, or that sort of thing can't they and, and by that stage people might have minted you know obviously blockchain versions of them so Totally. So, um, in fact, we do like we we're continually balancing the cards, even in our private beta, and we will continue to do so after mm -hmm. the game is live. And we're just very transparent about this fact that the card mechanics themselves are not immutable. They can be changed. Um, but the ownership of those cards, of course, no one can alter that um, except for the who owns the item. And this, to your point, John, it's incredibly important that we maintain the ability to balance the game because with the reactions and combinations of 500 unique cards and the fact that we'll add additional cards in the futures, you know, like we can't predict everything the way that everyone will use them. So you could have a game breaking card that just wins every match and then it kind of destroys the game for other people, right? Um, so we definitely need to maintain that ability to balance. And then we're simply transparent with the community, right? Like you know that this card could be balanced, but it's for the health of the overall game. And community. So effectively, you'll, you'll always have the control over the stats of the card and the NFTs will be the effectively the artwork sort of that's representing them. Yeah, it, at least for this foreseeable future, you know, like maybe in some distant time, it's like done by a DAO yeah. um, where people are voting on the mechanics. And, you know, like we while it's ultimately our decision, we're only doing it based on community feedback and data, right? Like we're seeing that this thing needs to be adjusted. So it's not like we're just arbitrarily saying, oh, let's nerf that card or, uh, or buff this one. I have to say, I mean, I think this is a broader sort of a debate that happens you know, in, in blockchain. Obviously, we have this sort of a you know, general thing about sort of what level of decentralization any blockchain sort of project should mm -hmm. have. And, and there's, I don't think there's any sort of right answer for that. There's, you know, there's obviously specific sort of um, types of product have different approaches. So a lot of the DeFi stuff has gone 
very highly decentralized and as you say you kind of moved to DAOs and, and, and really just said you know <laughs> we've, we've launched it um it, it's sort of gone obviously games i think there there is a sort of culture in some of the early blockchain kind of gaming people who, who want to go heavily decentralized but i think um a few that i've spoken to who have done that realized that, that you end up with a lot of problems that as you say can be sort of critical to the entire um kind of product kind of kind of kind of kind of lifespan so actually being a bit more centralized at least in the beginning is is sort of what you need if you want to have a, a game anyone's actually going to play for a, you know a period of time and certainly put money in yeah. totally yeah that's a, that's exactly what we think and um you know i think it's like a lot of projects right over time they can become increasingly decentralized if it makes sense and there's a community who truly cares it. um it, it could work well you know um i've just yeah, I just don't know what the future holds in that sense. So for now, we maintain control of the, the card mechanics. So um, uh, another sort of key question, whenever I sort of come across a, a trading card game, I am I am like you know genuinely hopeless at these sort of things. You know, I, you know, I sort of I see myself as sort of the typical person who sort of downloaded Hearthstone and played it for about half an hour and then was like, well, this is a bit complicated, <laughs> and, the, and then I was sort mm, of sort yeah, of at it. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, I always find it you know it's, it's one of those genres that is from a game design point of view, it's just it's quite problematic because you have these really hardcore people who you know grew up playing playing magic and just yeah they just absolutely immediately sort of sort of get every meta and they they you, you can't make a game too deep for those people i mean that's just what they love but obviously there's not yeah. not tend to be not that many of them they're very vocal but then obviously you you kind of you want a game like this to to go quite broad you know and i guess hearthstone's mm. success um, was it sort of managed to sort of can it, you know satisfy both of those kind of kind of tastes so how are you how are you sort of planning on the game design point of view to, 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 you know, do the best you can for those two quite different audiences? Yeah, so it's great because on our team, we have people who have worked um, at Magic or at uh, Wizards of the Coast. Um, we've had, you know, we have Hearthstone Legends on our team um, as well. And we've really designed it to be easy to learn. Like we have tutorials. It's very, we have a, a discovery mode where you you get a deck assigned to you, like a randomly generated deck assigned to you. So you don't even need to think about strategizing or constructing one. You can just kind of learn by, by trying. Mm. Uh, there's of course a tutorial in the game that shows you all of the mechanics. So we've made it very easy to learn with, with practice, et cetera. But at the same time, there's a ton of depth for those players, you know, like some of the magic players who, just like you said, man, they like literally, you cannot make it deep enough. And so there is a lot of complexity um for those that want it and a lot of like really novel mechanics in the game j just as a few examples um like the the units have attached spells so they're kind of like disposable um spells and, and attacks that you can administer in a turn uh, the gameplay is singleton so you can only have one of each card type in your deck uh you know i mentioned the discovery mode but of course we also have a constructed mode for those who want to build their own deck with cards they own and we've even included like an intuitive deck builder right in game to make it easy to do so um and yeah it's you know the the cards are uh, non-rotating so we've made the cards every card in sky river you'll be able to play with it forever like as i mentioned they might get nerfed and buffed but they'll never get rotated out of play so you know that your card will always have a use so yeah in a nutshell easy to learn for the beginners but with a depth and complexity mm -hmm. for the experts and how do you think, because um, another, another thing that is, you know, for, for a lot of blockchain projects, you sort of, again, have this sort of, um, and sort of the interesting thing about blockchain is, is, is you you have different sort of levels of players, obviously, for any game. But then with the blockchain stuff, you have people who, mm -hmm. who um, you know, may be more interested on the kind of, we could say, speculative or investment side of sort of particularly owning NFTs. And they may not, they may, yeah, that, I would consider them part of a community. They just maybe not have the time to play games or may not be interested in games, but they, they sort, sort of play a part as well. So... Do you think that you might, you, obviously you have the ability to have, you know, NFTs on a marketplace. Um, and so there is that, I guess you, you, you play into that sort of scarcity model. Um, but, but do you think, do you think you may be sort of missing out on, on, on the, those sort of people who, who may just be going, and I, I guess we have it quite a lot at the moment. People are going, what's the next Axie Infinity? What can I sort of invest in? Which is, you know, I, I think blockchain games need to be careful to distance themselves from sort of pure speculative kind of influences because it could be very damaging yeah. but equally you do want you do want some people with money to come in and, and sort of because because and buy things because they kind of raise the, the the price for everyone yeah um yeah it, you know as i mentioned earlier we've been very thoughtful about the economy design and we welcome 
all, all kinds, right? Like there are going to be players who just play the game and they never spend a, a cent because they're, you know, they're ranking highly and they're winning items or they just don't care to win items, right? Like they're just playing it for the gameplay alone. Like every single one of our private beta players thus far, right? Like they're not, I mean, they are competing. They can actually win a gold card if they're ranking in the top, but a lot of them, they won't rank there, right? So they're playing it for the gameplay alone. And then you're going to have people on the other end of the spectrum who buy cards and never play the game, you know, like they don't care about it. They just, maybe they love the artwork or maybe they see it as a, as a good opportunity, a speculative opportunity. Um, and, and we really, you know, we, we welcome, we welcome all those players. And what's cool is just like you said, is that the, because all cards are generated through gameplay, you can kind of think of it almost like proof of skill. And if someone else comes into the sky river market and buys that card, well, then it increases the value of those items. So then it's similar in the sense of like Bitcoin mining right from the beginning, right? It's like, obviously there are some miners, mm -hmm. but not that many compared to the number of people who own Bitcoin. Um, so it's really like, it's about creating this symbiosis so that no matter what your interest is, like there there is a, is a place for you in the game and the economy. And it is, um, yeah, it, and I guess it, it is quite a, uh, in terms of this, this term that i've never really liked but is now clearly kind of prevalent like kind of kind of kind of play to earn you, you sort of you sort of do have that you do have i think guess you have it at a slightly a slightly higher skill level um because people actually are going to need to actually understand the game um rather than some games just you just sort of turn yeah. up and, and <laughs> press a button and you, you get some stuff so. true yeah and it is an interesting term you know like we we actually I remember Peter, our, our CEO, he wrote a wrote a kind of an essay or like a thesis very early on. And he talked about play to earn back in 2018, but we've kind of shifted our narrative to be about play to own um, because it's about it's about owning something that you've won and, and trying to like emphasize less perhaps the money making component of it because it, you know, that that can could happen, but we don't want that to necessarily be the emphasis for every single person. You know, we want it to be a game. Um, and, and I think both can exist and, um, you know, something else maybe I'll, I'll touch on is like with the, the marketplace, there's even an opportunity for, um, providing liquidity to our market. So like we have in the game, we have what's called the Skyweaver market and it's built atop our nifty swap protocol. So Philippe on our team, our director of product, he actually authored this and it's largely inspired by Uniswap, but it's an automated market maker which makes price discovery simple and automatic so that players can really rest assured that they're, they're paying the best price for any card. And it ensures that you can always um, buy or sell your card to the market itself rather than concerning yourself if there is a purchaser on the other end for your exact item, right? So for those players or users who own a bunch of cards or who purchase a bunch of cards, they could then provide liquidity to the market. So let's say there's a, there's a card called Starfield in the game let's say they provide like a silver Starfield card to the market paired with USDC, then every time that that um, pairing gets traded on the Sky River market, that liquidity provider will actually earn a small fee. Um, so it is, mm. it's uh, it, it's really cool. And we actually think that um, it, it provides a wonderful experience as well um, with our, like we co-authored the ERC 1155 token standard for representing game items. And, and coupled with this marketplace, it allows for, really wonderful and easy price discovery which is difficult when you're working with 721s because each one of them is so totally unique from the other one that you can't really reference anything to to discover a price so it's you know i think it's obviously an evolving market but i think with 721s it's quite easy to buy them but it becomes more difficult to sell them because how do you know what to put it on the market for and how do you find the buyer that's, that's for super, it, right? That so, is super cool. Uh, you yeah. know, I've often wondered about that. Um, if, if uh, I think I tweeted it out about a year ago, if someone could sort of provide that because it's, it, I mean, it's, in some ways it's interesting that NFTs have this friction. So in a sense, that's kind of good because people can't sell them off. But then if you do want to sell them off, the only way to do that is by, is really by dropping the price, which then sort of takes the market on a declining, mm -hmm. you know, on a constant declining because any way anyone can sell anything is by dropping the price and having a lower price. So that's not very good for the overall Kind of kind of health of a project, so so I'll be fascinated to play around with that. That's a pretty good. But I guess does that mean then that you're when you're minting your cards, you don't really have serial numbers because some people get very obsessed with the, how serial numbers sort of change pricing. So do you have serial numbers or are they sort of? Hmm. Yeah, so it works a bit differently in the sense that like if you had an ERC seven twenty one, 
um, there would be, and let's just say like yeah. I was using this water bottle, right? This, this would be yeah. um, number yeah. one and that would be its serial number. If I had like a thousand of these water bottles, yeah. they would be number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And then I add in this, this phone. Um, and then it would be numbered 1000 and one right. after all the water bottles, right? Whereas with ERC 1155s, this water bottle could actually be serial number one. And then there's a thousand copies of it. And then the phone could be serial number two. Yeah. And then there's a thousand copies of it. So like it works a little bit differently, but, um, ultimately it's what we decided would be best for, you know, price discovery. Yeah. And Excellent. That, sounds, that sounds really, uh, really good. I, I love to see sort of innovation around that, that sort of stuff. So it's gonna be, uh. Fascinating to do to, uh, to uh, yeah. have a go at that. Good. Um, so there's sort of a big, um, I wouldn't say a big debate, but there's sort of a lot of interest at the moment, and, and I guess it's still a a, a, a phrase that's still sort of uh, re relevant. It's kind of, you know, when does blockchain gaming go go mainstream? And at some point, that question is answered. I don't think it's probably mm. kind of answered yet. So, um, you know, you guys have you know, been in blockchain for a long time. You've obviously thought seriously about about some of these. Um, kind of aspects of how blockchain sort of works with, with, with product, you're building up a lot of innovation in, in, in terms of the blockchain space. But how are you sort of, when you get to the launch phase of, of Skyweaver, which is, I guess, not that far away, you know, how are you positioning it for the blockchain people? Are you positioning it for people who like trading card games? Are you just going, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great game. Don't worry too much about the technology behind the scenes. How, how are you sort of, because I think, again, this is something that every project has a, probably a different right solution. There's no, there's no kind of there's no kind of yeah. you know there's no easy easy kind of answer that fits all. But where do you see yourself on that spectrum? Yeah, so Skyweaver is designed for gamers. We think the biggest audience at first will be the trading card game players, and then it will expand mm. beyond that. Of course, it's for blockchain people as well, um, but it's not exclusively for them. And you know, when we set out at the beginning of 2018, we really wanted to design products that our friends could use and specifically our friends who weren't necessarily in the blockchain space, right? And that's why we've gone to great lengths to make the user experience as seamless as possible. And that's actually why we've built an architected sequence, which consists of two things. So one, it's a user-friendly smart contract wallet for crypto, NFTs, and Web3. Basically, it's multi-chain and, you know, it's basically just a simple way that you can access this next generation of the internet, including Skyweaver. You know, there's social login, social recovery. You don't have to think about seed phrases or knowing about blockchain, um, just making it very intuitive. And, and then Sequence also consists of a developer platform component, um, just making for seamless development for Ethereum, NFTs, DeFi, dApps, Web3 in general, and all Ethereum compatible chains like Polygon. Etc. Um, so that, of course, us architecting all of this was informed by Skyweaver. So it assisted all of our design decisions and allowed us to, you know, and really like by making the game, it forced us to make something that was user friendly that a gamer could understand. So, to, you know, to quickly answer your question, it is designed for gamers who do not have any knowledge of crypto whatsoever. Um, but of course, we welcome all of the deeply passionate uh, crypto geeks like myself yeah. as well. It is interesting that you are, I think when you're launching, oh, there is actually a mobile, I think there's a mobile client or, or an app out at the moment as well. So obviously mobile is, is that one of those things where that's obviously where the broad market of, of, of gamers is. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's potentially issues around sort of app stores. Um, so I mean, do you see this as, as being a sort of mobile first game or is it just sort of a game that doesn't really matter what platform it's on? Yeah, um, it's web-based and we were very intentional about making it work awesome on both mm -hmm. mobile and desktop. So, and like, you know, in our private beta, the majority of players are from on mobile, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, not like overwhelmingly. Yeah. So I think it's about two thirds, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can definitely play it on your tablet as well. Like anything that has an internet mm -hmm. browser. Um, but to your point, yeah, there are iOS and Android apps as well. And you, you, do you foresee sort of, or, or what sort of issues do you foresee with Obviously, kind of app stores, I don't think, care particularly about crypto or blockchain, but they obviously care about getting their 30% of any kind of a payment. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle that? Yeah, so there's different different avenues, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty sure as it stands, like in the app store, it's just it's limited what um, purchases and things you can make. Um, but, you know, if you're playing it on your browser, it's it's totally mm -hmm. fine. Um, and, and yeah, like 
you know, with other, with Android and stuff, like you can make purchases and then, yeah, Android will, they'll take their fee. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a lot of like, there's regulatory concerns. There's just the different um, app stores models. And we just have to work with each to figure out like, okay, how can we do what's best for our users? Um, yeah, in a way that, that works for everyone. Mm-hmm. And in terms of if people uh, want, to, want to get in, involved in the private beta, what's this current kind of setup for that? Yeah, so I mean, you can you can go to skyweaver.chat. That's our Discord. And if you actually, there's a beta access claims channel. Um, if you go there, you can get a private beta code pretty quickly okay. um, just by you know filling out some stuff. Uh, you can also go to skyweaver.net and sign up for our waiting list and we'll send you a, a code that way. Mm-hmm. And how are you finding... And it's... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, it's cool too, because like if you play now, um, the top... Um, 1,000 players in our private beta will win a, a rare gold card. And this will be the only time those gold cards are ever created. So it's it's a cool rare item and incentive uh, prior to us going into soft launch, which is when our economy uh, goes fully live. And that'll happen in the coming months. And I do have to say, um, it is an incredibly uh, kind of polished product. I think a lot of the blockchain stuff we've seen, you know, for various reasons has been a little bit sort of clunky and a bit, of, you know, a little bit sort of thrown together. Whereas this, you know, seems you know the, the the ui is really nice it's very kind of clean um even i could make it through the tutorial although i'm not mm. entirely sure I, I fully understand what i was doing um so so it is from, from that it's, you know coming from my sort of background in sort of mobile which is very focused on on that kind of early experience and, and, and user experience i do think you've got a you know a good product to, to get people in there so it'd be kind of fascinating to see how when you when you kind of go into a more um yeah so a soft launch sort of thing how, how quickly you can sort of build up that that, that community because it's yeah you've obviously been spending the time spending the years well <laughs> oh yeah th- thanks for saying that man um it means a lot to us and i'll definitely well i'll share the podcast with our team too because <laughs> it's certainly um a big team effort we have a lot of special brilliant and, and passionate team members who are making all this stuff happen you know like personally i do zero coding so yeah. that that ui is very, has very little to do with me um, so I'll definitely pass that kudos along to everyone else. And it, it's nice because it echoes the sentiments of our community, you know, which consists of like, I would say probably around 80% or more people who have no experience in blockchain or crypto. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them who are like uh, professional magic players, or we even have like a Pokemon world champion who loves the game and Hearthstone players and, and just casual game players who are just kind of interested, mm-hmm. you know, in, in what's happening. So. It's really nice to hear you, you say that, and I'll, I'll pass the message along. Cool, cool. And I was sort of interested um, with, with with the kind of the, you know, the, uh, the the sequence stuff you're doing. So, yeah, I think we are seeing a few kind of blockchain game developers who, because obviously, you know, you've been in the trenches, you've been sort of building this stuff, for, you know, from for the last kind of couple of years, when there wasn't anything there. So you you, you have sort of created interesting technology, um, but it's quite a different business uh, allowing other developers to, to to use your tech. So how are you sort of finding that? Because you know, I, I just kind of even not even not blockchain stuff you know in the past where there's been people who've made games and then have kind of rolled out tech those end up being quite different businesses so have you found there's a sort of tension in there or or you know how do you see that playing out um yeah so like you know we, we wouldn't have been able to build sequence mm. uh the developer platform in the wallet without skyweaver you know we would have had to go find another independent project to build for and figure out like what's exactly required in this wallet for end users and what's exactly required in the developer platform. So for us, it's been incredibly symbiotic and in fact necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, And an analogy I like to make is what Epic Games did with Mm -hmm. Unreal Engine. You know, like they built it and for, I think it was around three years, like no one else used it. And then Epic came out with Unreal or or Unreal Tournament. I forget what its exact title was, but that game exploded in popularity. And then all of a sudden game developers around the world wanted to use uh, Unreal Engine. And, you know, now it's, now that's a, it's a great, platform used widely. And and similarly with us, Skyweaver informs the design decisions of Sequence and then also showcases its abilities. And, um, you know, in the behind the scenes, we're also working with some other projects to integrate uh, Sequence into their projects. You know, like we're part of Ubisoft's Entrepreneurs Lab, and Mm. we'd love to be their Web3 wallet and infrastructure provider for, you know, their vision of the metaverse and their future games. Mm. And there are some other projects we're working with as well. And, um, you know, as time goes on, the developer platform is going to be more and more self-serve and easier for people to work with. So, yeah, like to answer your question, you know, there is a little, there's tension at times with, you know, like where do we devote people? 
but it's been this organic and evolving process and with both of them working so harmoniously together it's actually been incredibly and have you started to see that us. sort of uptick from particularly from the game developers side because you know i've just for 2021 in particular yeah the, I've had a lot more contact with people who who have you know really know how to make games and have never really understood blockchain and right. now realizing they have to sort of understand it and 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 um and I just got to wonder you, mm-hmm. is it still a bit early for people coming in and asking to use your tech or are you seeing a sort of change in attitude? Um, it's interesting, man, because like we're not we're not mm-hmm. actively marketing sequence right now. You know, like having conversations, of course. Um, but we have a lot of inbound interest and it ranges from games to marketplaces and exchanges to social applications. Um, so there definitely is demand for this. And a lot of it's just people have heard what we're building oftentimes through Polygon because we're very close with that team and they recognize how what we're building is very supportive Mm -hmm. of that ecosystem, um, and Ethereum generally. So, yeah, I, th- I think there's interest. And, you know, like the large players, the, the big gaming companies, you know, mm-hmm. Ubisoft's been super interested in this space for yeah. pretty much as long as we've been around. And, um, you know, and, and I think they're, they have great thinking around it. And there are other big players that are uh, thinking about it now, too. So, yeah, there's demand. And I, I mean, I imagine you're in this space for a similar, uh, with a similar thinking as to us that, like, mm-hmm. this is the future of, um, probably not just gaming, but like the internet generally. And I think even this notion of what is gaming is yeah. going to evolve mm. tremendously because like everyone, everyone today growing up anyway is a gamer in some capacity. And then when we start layering in like VR and stuff, it's like, what do you call a game mm. experience? What is not a game experience? So um, yeah, there. I'm, I, yeah, I guess it's just, it's really exciting. No, in, in, entirely. I kind of think, you know, on the base level, as soon as you have, we had the internet and now we have internet money that's kind of like <laughs> the sort of fulfillment of the internet now and, and now we have games where you're not you're not you're not paying i mean you might still be paying money kind of in, mm. paying money out but also you get the ability even the ability to sort of get get value including financial value back again i mean that sort of changes everything that's the you know i'm sure there'll be some absolutely terrible blockchain games as there were some terrible <laughs> vr games some terrible mobile games but it, but it, but that but the you know the the quality of the experiences at the top level um, are, are going to be, yeah, going to be amazing. So, absolutely, totally. very polished. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be as eventually, like as convincing as an immersive as this physical reality we live in. That I oftentimes talk about, like maybe we currently exist in a blockchain-based physical reality. <laughs> you know, like if if I give my shirt to you, I no longer have it. There's no yeah. double spending of it. You now have it, right? And um, maybe we're in a blockchain based VR right now. And now we're just we're building on this other dimension where we get to um, instill it with new new values, more evolved values. And mm. so I, I think it's I think it's really special uh, what we get to do. Cool. cool. Sounds like we're, we're heading down another rabbit hole a podcast for, for, for another time, maybe <laughs> where we get all speculative and, and philosophical about what's going on. <laughs> but we'll stick to games. Thank you very much, Michael. That was really fascinating to, to hear uh, what you guys are up to. Awesome. Thank, thanks so much, John. And, and just so anyone out there listening, if they, uh, if you're, if you resonate with what we're doing, we are hiring for a lot of people. So careers.horizon.io, and we would, we'd love to hear from you if you're passionate and, and skilled in this space. Cool. Good. I'll put that in the in the show notes so people can access that. Lovely. And uh, and, and thank you, uh, listeners and and and, and watchers for. Uh, for, for watching and listening to the podcast. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I normally at this point say every week we're talking to the people building this new uh, sector. I've not, I've not, I've been a bit, I've been a bit lazy. I've, I've not been doing it every week, I have to admit. But we are, we are, <laughs> I'm just so busy with other things, uh, but we are, we are doing it every, every regularly, every few weeks. Let's, let's put it that way. So, so <laughs> please do subscribe um, through, the, through the usual channels. Um, and and uh, as I say, I just find this sort of intellectually fascinating how, how, how gaming is going to change and going to change fairly quickly. So if you want to sort of be, be ahead of the news, um, please do subscribe. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.